Welcome everyone. We are so delighted to have you here for our waterside chat tonight, understanding the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with Susan Golden. A few things to note before we get started. We will be having a Q&A after Susan's presentation. So there will, there will be time for any questions that you may have to be answered. If any thoughts come up during her presentation, feel free to write your questions in the chat box and we will read them during the Q&A. I also wanted to remind everyone to please keep your microphones muted during the chat. I want to introduce myself to you all. My name is Abby and I'm the program manager at Water Spirit. Water, and I am joined tonight by Water Spirit's executive director, Blair Nelson, and our public policy and justice organizer, Rachel Dawn Davis. We are so excited to have you guys here. A little bit about Water Spirit. Water Spirit is one of the several ministries in New Jersey established by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace. We are a center of ecology and spirituality that informs, inspires, and enables all people to deepen their consciousness of the sacredness and interdependence of all creation with the focus on water as critical in sustaining all life. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with environmental educator, Susan Golden. And I want to share a little bit about Susan with you all as well. Susan earned a bachelor's degree at Dartmouth College, where she majored in engineering sciences, and then went on to work for several, several years in the private sector. Her mission is to help people understand how we interact with our shared home, the earth. To that end, she works with several nonprofit conservation organizations she speaks to regional community groups about current environmental issues, and she also tutors local teenagers in several STEM subjects. Susan has met with thousands of people in the Northeast region and continues to reach all types of groups with her talks. And her efforts extend beyond speaking. She has dedicated hundreds of hours to community service in various capacities, including community cleanups, and curriculum development for educational programs. Currently, she serves on the boards of the Hackensack Riverkeeper and the Tenafly Nature Center, and she is a past chairperson of her local environmental commission. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight, Susan. Thank you so much, Abby. Thanks for those kind words. And I, I do wanna add though that I am a retired high school science teacher, math also, so I've actually taught classes in biology, chemistry, physics, and it was when I decided, when I started teaching environmental science that this really, it, a light bulb went off and I realized how few people really know about how society interacts with the environment. So thank you for that lovely intro. And, uh, but enough about me, why don't we get started? So let me I'm share sure. my screen and um, let's, get this going. Okay, so Abby, tell me if you, if we, I'm just gonna assume you can see this unless I hear otherwise. So yes. this is me. If you wanna learn more about me, that's my website. Um, it has some of the other programs that I also offer. Um, but tonight we're gonna to talk about the sustainability and uh, particularly in terms of the water goals, that's what I like to call them and how, Sustainability is how we're gonna create a world where all our children can thrive. And as a new grandmother, I want my grandson to have a healthy world and to grow up uh, and enjoy all the different aspects of it that I have. So again, I'm a teacher, so let's make sure we're at the same page. And what is sustainability? Well, so something that's sustainable is the ability to be maintained at a consistent rate or level. And in terms of humanity and modern society, sustainability is the ability to create communities where all people have the basic necessities to enjoy a healthy, productive life uh, for many generations. And no man is an island anymore. 
Um, since 2008, as a matter of fact, the majority of the global population lives in urban centers. So we really have to work on having sustainable communities. And in order to achieve these, we need something called sustainable development. And uh, sustainable development now, I know I'm, I'm being very picky here. We're gonna have a vocab test at the end. No, just kidding. But that means taking deliberate action to preserve the well being of the population. So let me be a little bit more specific about this. According to academicians, sustainable development um, is a way to understand the world that about the complex interaction of economic and social and environmental sustainability and among political systems. And when you need, when we create sustainable systems like this in all air, and I'm not so, sorry, we can create sustainable systems and we use all these areas. We look into economic development, we make sure nobody's left behind and we protect the environment. That is when we will have sustainable development. So how does this relate to those sustainable development goals in particular? Um, so according to the UN, current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, the 17 global goals were agreed by all world leaders in 2015 to address the challenges that include poverty, inequality, the climate crisis, environmental degradation, peace and justice by a deadline of 2030, a very tall order to do. And uh, we're gonna talk about how well we're doing on all those different goals. So those 17 goals look like this, and uh, we're not gonna go into all of them tonight, but I am gonna start by reading them all to you in case you're on a small screen. So let's take a look at them and how they pertain to each of those other areas that I mentioned. So in terms of environmental sustainability, and we will be looking at, these, at three of these goals tonight, 13 is climate action, 14 life below water, 15 life on land, that's protecting um, and, and uh, maintaining the biodiversity in all those, in both land and water. And then clean water and sanitation, that's both for the environment as well, of course, it's also a social issue. Everyone should have clean water and sanitation. And I'm gonna start with that in a few minutes, but I still wanna continue with some background. Those goals that pertain to social inclusion so that everyone can have a healthy life uh, we want to end poverty and end hunger. We want good health and well being, in other words, access to health care for all, a quality education, gender equality, affordable and clean energy, as well as sustainable cities and communities, and peace, justice, and strong institutions. And although this isn't water, we're going to be addressing this target as well, a goal, rather. So, in terms of um, the economic growth, the goals that pertain to that are decent work and economic growth, industry, innovation, and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, and responsible consumption and production. And I'm not going to be focusing on these tonight. I have another presentation where I address uh, all of the uh, sustainable development goals. And the one that I haven't mentioned yet, which I'm not going to is other than this, is partnerships for the goals. And that's simply that the United Nations knows they can't do this alone. So they are actively and continually forming partnerships with private government and public organizations to achieve these. Tonight, uh, I'd like to look at this in a different way. We're gonna focus on the biosphere and the environment, but I learned of this hierarchy. Uh, some other academicians suggested this when they were studying food. And we can consider the goals in a form of hierarchy. And basically we need to have a healthy environment so that the planet can provide us with everything we need. And I'll go into that in a minute. And once the, the uh, planet is providing us with the things we need, then we can make sure that everyone has an opportunity to have their needs met and an inclusive society. No one should get left behind. And that doesn't mean that we, everyone needs to be equal but everyone should have access to those basic necessities of life, shelter, food, and an opportunity for a decent uh, live, to earn a decent living. And then if we take care of the planet and we take care of people, we can create economies uh, where they are able to sustain us and they allow us uh, to create wealth by maintaining 
this type of situation where um, everyone is needs are met and the planet is sustainable in terms of resources for future generations. So today we're gonna to focus on those goals that pertain to the biosphere, particularly we're gonna look at uh, goal six, as I mentioned earlier, clean water and sanitation, 13, climate action, 14, life below water, and then 16, which is up here actually, uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So uh, we're gonna look at, our tar at their targets of these goals and our progress towards them. But I wanna start on a little bit of background because it's so important and because of our focus on environmental sustainability in general and protecting the biosphere and the planet and why that's so important. And I wanna point out that there are 7.8 billion people on the planet right now. And no matter our culture or our color or our customs, we all have the same base needs. And no matter um, what we use and what we do, 7.8 billion people make a big impact on this planet. And we all use resources to build our cities and our things. That one building, the Empire State Building, has 70 miles, 70 miles of water pipes. If you laid it down, it would go across the state of New Jersey. And that's one building in one city on the world. So imagine how many resources we use up uh, on a global basis. We use other resources to provide food for ourselves and our livestock. As a matter of fact, 65% of all the fresh water on the planet is used for agricultural purposes. We use lots of resources to power our modern society. We use it for electricity as well as transportation. And in addition to using resources, 7.8 billion people generate a lot of waste. We generate liquid waste, solid waste, and gas. We don't, right now, we do not extract our resources or deal with our waste in sustainable fashion. As a matter of fact, I wanna get into one more uh, definition. I think this is the last one tonight, but I want to define what is environmental sustainability. So it occurs when there's a balance that allows us to satisfy our needs, to get our resources and consume our products without exceeding that capacity of the supporting ecosystems or without diminishing biological diversity. Well, that's not happening right now, unfortunately. We're straining many of the planet's natural systems. We're uh, going beyond, they call it the planet's natural boundaries. And I'd like to give you some examples of environmental degradation that we're seeing to understand why it is just so important uh, that we aim for uh, all these sustainable development goals, but in particular environmental sustainability, both on land and in water. So we're seeing uh, incredible biodiversity loss that's speeding up from all these different factors in terms of land use change, loss of habitat, freshwater depletion, pollution on land and in water, eutrophication, one of my new favorite words, that means too many nutrients in the water supply as well as invasive species. So we are, the scientists are considering it. We're at the beginning of the sixth grade extinction and already we are seeing many uh, species in decline. Just recently I learned the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has, uh, has an article that there are 3 billion fewer birds today than there were in 1970, 3 billion. So, and there's no, not much hope of things coming back unless we do something. We're also seeing a lot of pollution as you're I'm sure aware. And if we continue to overfish and continue to dump uh, plastic into our oceans by 2050, experts are saying that there'll be more plastic in our ocean than fish. And recent reports have just come out that we are ingesting plastic on a regular basis, primarily from uh, ingesting fish. We're also seeing now that our food production methods are not sustainable. Um, while we had a green revolution late last century, which helped us to feed these billions of people uh, now on the planet, it, it brought with it significant environmental impacts that we're going to hopefully change in the near future. And why is this not sustainable? Because 
Our production methods, not only monocrop isn't the way to go, but it requires too much water and too many chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, and uh, herbicides, and pesticides as well. So um, the biggest issue though facing us besides COVID-19 is climate change. And climate change, I again have a whole presentation on this. I'm not gonna go into it except to talk about the biggest impacts. And of course our carbon dioxide, this is the part of the dashboard from NASA actually. And the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continues to increase. Our global temperature has gone up already in the last hundred years over two degrees, that's Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Sea level continues to rise. As a matter of fact, the New Jersey and New York right here around the harbor has already, sea level has risen over a foot in the last hundred years. They have that by tide gauge and satellite data. You can go to Rutgers to find out more on that. And the ice sheets are melting at an incredible rate so much so that scientists are having to rewrite the models because they're not doing an adequate job. And unfortunately, every time I check, these numbers are getting larger and larger. So climate change is actually, how is it impacting the planet? It's changing weather patterns and some places are getting drier, storms are getting bigger uh, and more frequent. Sea level rise uh, is not only creating a storm surge damage, which is one of the most expensive things, but we're getting salination of um, farmlands and we're seeing things like what you see here. This is sunny day flooding uh, from Miami in 2016. This is not a puddle from a rainstorm. This is an exceptional high tide where the water, instead of going out the down the drain, storm drains, came up the storm drains. And there are many images of, um, of this happening and it's happening more frequently all over the world. It happens in the New York metropolitan area as well on a more regular basis. And since 40% of the global population lives on the coasts, more and more people will be affected by this. And the bottom line on climate change is it affects everything from biodiversity uh, and water availability, health and food productivity, it even affects our property values. So it's creating a moving target for us to meet and we have to do something. Uh, we cannot sustain this global lifestyle for many more generations uh, and have climate change hit the upper boundaries of what we're predicting it to be because then we'll have some catastrophic events, more catastrophic events. So we don't have environmental sustainability right now. And I showed you some things that aren't working in situations, but let's try to be hopeful and what would work what, and these things that will work will help us meet the targets of the sustainable development goals. So let's see where we gotta go. First thing we have to do is stop burning fossil fuels and curb our greenhouse gas emissions across the board. And uh, we saw with the COVID shutdown that if we stop doing that, the air will clean up very quickly. Most cities around the world cleaned up last March and April have significantly lower particulate matter and other pollutants uh, because of the shutdowns that we ha had around the world. Um, we need to decarbonize electricity, create our power from clean renewable resources. We have to decarbonize our transportation. Um, in this country, transportation is one of the biggest sources of air pollution as well as our greenhouse gas emissions. Imagine how much cleaner the air would be if we take all the polluting cars and make them run clean, especially here in New Jersey, because this is one of the biggest causes of pollution right here in our state. And among other actions, we need to adopt more regenerative farming techniques, smart, climate smart agriculture practices, help retain soil structure, organic matter and moisture under drier conditions. And so we need to stop monocrop agriculture, adopt no-till farming, reduce the use of chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers. We also need to protect our green spaces. And I'm not, while I call it green, I'm talking on land and in the water as well. We have to recognize these benefits to humans as well as other species. Uh, they are actually even economic benefits, but they're not as measurable because uh, we don't actually pay for a lot of these things. And of course, we have to stop polluting and aim for a zero waste economy and learn to have 
more circular product life cycles rather than the linear ones that we've had for um, in all of our previous existence. Well, not all, since the industrial era, let's put it that way. So the bottom line is we have to maintain a healthy biosphere so the planetary systems will work for us and for all other life that calls this planet home. So now I want to, that's my synopsis on environmental sustainability and where we need to go in general. And now I'd like to uh, shift directions and take a deeper dive into what I'm calling the water goals. So I want to look at uh, 6, 13, and 14. And each of these goals, I think I mentioned it earlier, but we'll just review it. Of the 17 goals for the sustainable development from the United Nations, they have a com combination of 169 targets. And um, these targets have indicators. So all of this and the United Nations, we're really trying to have evidence-based decision-making, evidence-based uh, analysis and results. And so you can learn all about these. I'm, I don't know the timing of the chat, but there is going to be a link that talks about the targets and the indicators. Uh, maybe Abby can put that in or, or uh, Blair. And just to give you an idea, this is one page. Um, if you look at the target, this is 6.3, and I'm gonna get into this in more detail, so you don't have to worry right now, but the each here's a target and here are the two indicators. So this is improved water quality by reducing pollution, eliminating dumping and minimizing release of hazardous chemicals and materials, et cetera. And the indicator is the proportion of wastewater safely treated and the proportion of bodies of water with good water quality. So that's the indicators for this. And 6.4 is to increase water use efficiency across all sectors. And again, uh, it's to look at the indicator is the change in water use efficiency over time and the level of water stress, which would be fresh water withdrawal as a proportion of available fresh water resources. And the UN is predicting a lot of in, a bit significant increase in uh, water stress as time goes on. But just to give you an idea, these are some targets and indicators, and we're gonna mostly be looking at what the targets are. And uh, so I just wanna start, these are the targets for uh, goal six. So the real goal six, the full one is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And we're not there yet. So um, there are six targets for this goal. And then afterwards, people were concerned that they wouldn't make those targets. So there are actually, for each of these, there's something called implementation targets and they're lettered, but I'm gonna hit them all, so don't worry. So the first one is uh, target six one is we want safe and affordable drinking water for everybody. Cause there still isn't, there are people that still don't have this. And then we want uh, to end open defecation and provide access to sanitation and hygiene. There are millions of people still that don't have access to uh, managed sanitation facilities. We want to improve water quality and wastewater treatment, as well as look for safe reuse of the water. Um, as a matter of fact, my daughter goes to MIT and they have a rainwater uh, capture uh, area and they use that rainwater for flushing toilets in one of the dorms and buildings, which is very cool. Um, we want to increase water use efficiency and ensure fresh water supplies. Um, target uh, target six five is to implement integrated water resources management, not only across sectors, and this is something that's seriously lacking, but also across borders because many water bodies actually cross political boundaries. So, uh, uh, and the last one is to protect and restore water related ecosystems, of course, because without the, without healthy ecosystems, we're not going to have healthy water supplies. So these are the targets for this goal. And in order to get them, we have two more targets. So target 6A is to expand water and sanitation support for developing countries. So that's give them to get them funds as well as bring in some infrastructure and technology to help them uh, to expand uh, these offerings. And target 6B is to support local engagement in water and sanitation management. So that's help people to help themselves. So those are the targets for goal number six, ensuring avail 
uh, available uh, and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. And now let's take a look at the progress. As I do that, I need to show you a legend because otherwise you're not gonna understand the next couple of uh, th these graphics that I'm gonna show you. So they made a dashboard um, and that's the progress towards the goal chart is the document that has all these. And if the target has been met, the whole uh, arch will be colored. And if it's not uh, very far from the target, only one unit will be measured. And if it's all gray, there's no there's insufficient data to report. So they're all gonna have colors, thank goodness. It's not all black and white. If it's green, it means that we made substantial progress and we're on track to meet the goal. Some of them are dated before 2030, but many of them, of course, we just need to do it by 2030. Yellow, it's kind of like a traffic light. Yellow means we're making some progress, but we need to do more if we want to complete the goal. Uh, red means we're going in the wrong direction totally. And you'll note the arrows here. And orange means we made a little progress, but if you see the triangle like this kind of means we're stagnated and, and not doing enough, uh, really not doing much. So that said, for goal number six, they broke it into just two areas, and this is achieve universal access to safely uh, manage drinking water services and achieve universal access to safely manage sanitation services. And then across the top are the different regions of the world. The first one is an aggregate and an average of world, uh, how they're doing. And then we have the different uh, seven regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, Northern Africa and Western Asia, Central and Southern Asia, Eastern and Southeastern Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, the Pacific Island countries, and then the developed countries, which include the United States, Europe, and Australia, uh, among others. So if you look at this uh, very quickly, I, I don't want to dwell too much, but so access to safely managed drinking water, this is saying that we're somewhat to the goal, but we're not doing very much to get there. And here we're saying we are again uh, doing, we're getting, we're kind of at the goal, but we're not go moving fast enough in Central and Southern Asia, but they are moving. And here, just to give you an idea in terms of having universal access to sanitation, we're partially uh, at, towards the goal and moving ahead at a nice pace. In Eastern and Southeastern Asia, they're making good strides to actually get sanitation to all in that region of the world. And then these, again, these green, these gray empty arcs like that uh, are insufficient data to report. So I don't see a lot of gray, green on this, which is a little depressing. But let's take a look at uh, some more details about the progress. So despite progress, um, before, uh, before COVID, this is mostly 2019, actually this slide is 2017 data, that's the most recent data they have. Two billion people lack safely managed drinking water and four billion people lack safely managed sanitation. Two, four billion people don't even have toilets or latrines still in the 21st century. And that just blows me away. So another way to look at it, I happen to like this graph, so I threw it in here. The goal is that we have 100% of, of the goal being met, of these targets being met. And so this is data from 2000, and then the latest data is 2017. And so these are the different goals that we talked to, just, I just referred to, or targets. These are different targets I referred to. And this is the percentage of the world that is meeting those targets. And while we've got 90% here that have some basic drinking water, and that's a great thing, we want everyone to be at 100 by 2030. And we've got a ways to go depending on uh, what we're looking at here. So uh, some other facts that happened because of COVID in particular, there are still 3 billion people, 3 billion people, that's almost half the world that don't have basic hand washing facilities as home at home, which of course is the most effective method for COVID prevention as well as other diseases. And two in five healthcare facilities worldwide have no soap and water or alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer. So how are these people supposed to be protecting themselves uh, in this pandemic? Very sad. 
And um, we could be seeing more and more water scarcity uh, even in the next 10 years and 700 million people, there, this is according to the United Nations, could be displaced because of water scarcity, which would be um, primarily a drought or just a lack of, of uh, fresh water. And of course, this leads among other things, uh, it can lead to political instability because people cannot live if they cannot have water, as you know. So that's the progress where we're at with uh, goal number six, clean water and sanitation for all. And now I'd like to just touch on goal 13, which is uh, urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. So while this sounds a lot like the Paris Accord, it turns out that there is no formal agreement linking this goal to the Paris Accord that everyone signed uh, in 2015, same year but they are parallel efforts and they want to do a, a bit. And I think that so, this is a little lacking as you'll see in a minute because there is the Paris Accord. But while these goals, uh, these targets aren't, uh, there aren't, there's only three targets for this goal. Um, here's what, the, here's our progress. Let's just start there. And they didn't even bother to talk about the different regions because the whole world is far from meeting uh, the target. In other words, we are not uh, mitigating, taking enough actions to mitigate global warming. And unfortunately, we're seeing that uh, deteriorate even further. So let's see what those targets are that we want to get to, and hopefully we can turn things around. Um, so again, there are only three with two implementation targets. And the first one is to strengthen the resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related hazards and natural disasters in all countries around the world. We want to integrate uh, climate change measures into national policies, strategies and planning. And uh, President Biden just last night was talking about some of these, which at least gives me a lot of hope in this country. And we know that the European uh, Union is aiming for a green recovery. So these are uh, wonderful measures and hopefully will accelerate our actions in terms of climate action. Uh, number three is to improve education, awareness raising and human and institutional capacity on climate change mitigation, adaptation and impact reduction as well as early warning. And uh, that's what you guys are doing right now. We're actually working towards uh, goal target 13.3, which is kind of cool. And then the two um, uh, transition uh, targets are um, to implement the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this actually was a convention that was entered into force in 1994 and ratified by 197 countries. And among other things, it provides money to address the needs of developing countries in the context of mitigation actions and transparency on implementation of climate change policies. So among other things, it sets up bodies into action so that the developed countries can help the developing countries uh, to implement some of the necessary things they need to do. And we also, the other goal is, or target is to promote mechanisms so not only money, but other things that raise capacity for effective climate change related planning and management in least developed countries, as well as small island developing states. And this includes focusing on women, youth and local and marginalized communities. So uh, this is our targets that we're hoping to meet. Again, you saw that, that dashboard thing where we got a long way to go. So we still see that climate change is continuing to exacerbate the frequency and severity of natural disasters. We're seeing more wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, and floods. And in 2018 alone, according to the United Nations, it affected 39 million people that one year. We're seeing um, the good news or the bad news is only 85 countries have natural, they're called a national disaster risk reduction strategy. And uh, I'll talk in a second about the Sendai, Sendai framework. But so it, the United Nations is saying we need to have, and I think it makes sense, 
disaster risk reduction plans. How do we avoid we you know this? How do we avoid the next pandemic so that we're not stuck for two years uh, sequestered in our homes? We need plans for risk reduction like that. And in um, 2015 in Sendai, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Japan. Uh, they had a conference, the third UN World Conference on, on this disaster risk reduction and came up with this framework that was adopted. And it outlines uh, several, it outlines seven clear targets and four priorities for action to prevent new and reduce existing disaster risks. So again, put the link can be put in the chat if you wanna learn more. But the idea also is to build back better, which we're hearing uh, from some progressive governments about COVID. And hopefully we can continue to accelerate those efforts. Unfortunately, we're still seeing more investment in fossil fuels than we have been seeing investment in climate activities. The number, uh, the amount of money going into climate change mitigation and adaptation is increasing, but we need to be uh, increasing it way more. And I'm certainly pushing for divestment from fossil fuel companies. Uh, we need to put our money into greener areas. So uh, we, again, before COVID-19, the global community has been shying away from their commitments required to uh, reverse a uh, climate crisis. 2019 was the second warmest year. That's when the, while this report came out in 2020, that's the data they had at the time. 2020 tied 2016 as the hottest year on record. However, in New Jersey, the hottest year on record is 2012, according to the State Office of Climatology. Um, and that's 2020 would have been the hottest year on record, but we happen to have a cold April and May. And so that brought the average down um, for the year. And this also shows that global warming does not affect the world in a uniform way. So uh, just to give you a local news, one silver lining about COVID, as I mentioned earlier, that we had a 6% drop in greenhouse gas emissions for 2020, and that was great. And again, during that shutdown last March and April and May, we saw in just a few weeks, cities, the air pollution uh, cleaned up significantly. They were talking about seeing the Himalayas and all these other wonderful things that, that people noticed. So there's hope, we can do this. So just keep that in mind as I keep going. So that's for climate action that needs to be done. Now let's switch and look at goal 14, which is oceans. And uh, oceans cover, as you know, over 70% of the planet. There's over a million species that call the uh, oceans home. So we have to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, the seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So let's take a look at the targets. There are uh, seven targets for this goal and three implementation targets as well for a total of 10. So here we go. The first one is to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities. Uh, and that includes debris as well as nutrient pollution. And they've set a date, they're hoping to do that by 2025, so not 2030. And by, uh, they've actually, again, have some of these were even last year to sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts, to strengthen their resilience and restore them where necessary in order to achieve healthy and productive oceans. We need to minimize and address the impacts of ocean acidification. Uh, and you know the oceans are becoming more acidic because they're not only absorbing a lot of the extra heat uh, that's in our atmosphere, but they're also absorbing the extra carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. And when that dissolves in the water, it forms carbonic acid. And we're seeing ocean acidification increase on a ra uh, rapidly. So the rate is actually increasing. We also need to effectively regulate harvesting and end overfishing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, as well as destructive fishing practices. And we need to implement science-based management plans. We need to conserve coastal and marine areas and uh, 
they say we've met this, it was by last year, and that's to conserve at least 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, consistent with national and international law. Uh, also by last year, they were hoping to prohibit certain forms of fishery subsidies, which contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. They, by 2030 now, we wanna increase the economic benefits of small island developing states and least developed countries uh, by using marine resources sustainably. And so there actually is an effort to help these countries get more economic benefits from the use of uh, ocean and sustainable management of fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism. So how do we get there? One of the implementation targets is to increase scientific knowledge, develop research capacity and transfer marine technology in order to improve ocean health and to enhance the contribution of marine biodiversity to the development of developing countries. Again, in particular, small island developing states and least developed countries. The other, another implementation target is to provide access to small scale art, uh, fisheries to maintain um, their resources and the markets to particularly help them uh, and also to enhance the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and the resources by implement, implementing international law. And uh, there was a law, it's the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And uh, so I keep mentioning these other treaties because the United Nations has been doing a lot that we might not be aware of in this country, unfortunately. So that this um, law of the sea provides a legal framework for the conservation and sustainable use of oceans and their resources. And that was adopted. So that's goal number 14 and its targets. So how are we doing? Well, uh, actually, they only broke it down into two targets for this. And one is increase the proportion of fish stocks within biologically sustainable levels. In other words, stop overfishing and stop polluting and we're not near the goal and we're not making much progress. That's what this says on a global basis. In terms of uh, conserving at least 10% of coastal and marine areas. Well, the good news that uh, in much of the world we've actually done that and we're making progress to do it. So we met it in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the countries that aren't landlocked, Latin America and the Caribbean and the Pacific Island countries have at least uh, put set aside 10% of their ecosystems and marine areas. Uh, and in developed countries, they don't have enough data to be reporting here. So let's talk again a little bit about some of the specific targets that we just looked at. So ocean acidification does continue to threaten marine environments and ecosystem services, and it's increasing uh, at an at a increasing rate. We're also seeing um, the good news is that once again, because we had a drastic reduction in human activity, a lot fewer people on the, on the, on the beaches, a lot less industry and all, that may have given uh, a chance for the oceans to recuperate a bit. And I was just speaking to somebody who does a lot of diving and they said the beaches are looking, their coral that they dive uh, in Hawaii, for example, seem to be doing better than they were a year ago. But what will happen as we come out of this pandemic and these shutdowns is a good question. So we're also seeing that marine key biodiversity areas are the protected areas are being increased and that's like coral reefs, for example. We need to protect these spaces and more and more we're, they are being protected uh, by making them preserves and things like that, um, underwater preserves. But still in 2019, only 46% of them uh, were protected. And we also need to um, enforce those protections, which is another issue altogether. And it turns out that kind of good news, we have 97 countries that have signed the agreement on port state measures. So this is the first binding international agreement on illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing that I mentioned in one of those targets. And so they have 97 out of about 200 countries have signed that. And again, if you want more information on that, I have the link to NOAA, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric uh, et cetera, <laughs> administration, 
Um, the United States page on discussing this, um, the first, this uh, port state measures, the agreement on port state measures through the United Nations. That's how the United States is involved in that. So we have a lot of work to do on um, saving our oceans is the bottom line here on goal number 14. But we have those targets uh, that we're aiming for, which is good. So that's it on water. And I do uh, want to touch on um, peace, justice, and strong institutions, because that's also so important to our future. And so the full goal is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, to provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. So I want to uh, switch up the order a little and talk about where we are today. So don't know if you know it, I didn't know it before I started studying this, a hundred civilians are killed in armed conflicts every day, despite protections under international law. And uh, so luckily we don't see too much of that here in the United States, although we have way too many killings anyway. Um, the COVID implications are threatening global peace and security. As of 2019, the number of people fleeing war, persecution, and conflict exceeded 79 million people, the highest level ever recorded. So people continue to migrate. And once again, this is affects um, political stability as well as environmental stability in different areas of the planet. And with the COVID implications, uh, which they don't mention here, Many times these people end up in refugee camps and other places where they can't practice social, safe social distancing, don't have the access to the uh, personal protection that we have like face masks and hand washing, et cetera. So 60% of the countries around the world, 60% have prison overcrowding, which also uh, increases the spread of COVID-19. And 127 countries, about half, have adopted uh, a right to information acts or freedom of information laws. So that's good that people can uh, make sure they're safe. And we're seeing that the global homicide rate is slowly declining. So um, when you talk about these two uh, numbers in 2015 and 2018, uh, we have 440,000 homicide victims worldwide, which is way just, that's just that many too many. So what are the targets for this goal? So that's where we're at. So some of the targets are to, the first one is to reduce violence everywhere and related death rates. And the second one is to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence against, uh, against a, children, as well as a torture of children. We won't need to end that, of course. Um, specifically, we need to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. By 2030, we want to significantly reduce illicit financial and arms flows. We want to strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets and combat all forms of organized crime. And I've just recently been hearing of some countries returning uh, some um, from museums, returning some things like to the government of Nigeria, which is awesome. So we're starting to see some of that, which is great news. Uh, we go target number 16, five is to substantially reduce corruption and bribery in all their forms. This is a big issue in many countries around the world. And, uh, Goal, target number 16.6 six, is to develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels. And yet there's more. This is a lot of targets here because this is so important and so broad. Uh, target number 16.7 uh, is to ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. So have the stakeholders, uh, give them a voice. Right, that's what this one means. Give the stakeholders a voice to broaden, and not only to give them a voice, but to broaden and strengthen the participation of developing countries in the institutions of global governance. So not only on a national level and internal, 
but externally too, the developing countries need to have a voice in how we are going to interact on a global basis. By 2030, uh, it's a target to provide legal identity for all, and that includes birth registration. So in, there are still places around the world where you don't get a birth certificate. And if you want to uh, emigrate from that country, like go to college, let's say in the United States or the developed world, you need a birth certificate or you're not going to get in. So this is a significant um, issue in terms of uh, equality for all and allowing people to move about. And the last uh, regular target in this is to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. And then the implementation targets are to strengthen relevant national institutions. And that's to build capacity at all levels to prevent violence and combat terrorism and crime. And I loved how President Biden just last night said that white supremacy is terrorism. And uh, so he's building capacity for that particular issue. And we need to promote and enforce non-discriminatory laws and, po and policies for sustainable development. And of course that has a lot to do with uh, how many people in this country think about the Black Lives Matter movement, non-discriminatory laws, we need to end systemic racism. So those are the targets for this goal, how are we doing? So here's that dashboard again, and they just brought it down and broke it down into three areas here, significantly reduced homicide rates. And in certain areas, we're doing better than others. So in Central and Southern America, we're kind of there, sorry, wrong part of the world, Central and Southern Asia, uh, we're getting better and we're making progress towards the goal. Uh, in Eastern and Southeastern Asia, we've actually met the goal and it, we're this is a good thing. In other areas, we're not doing so well like the Pacific Island countries. In Latin America, I heard somebody speaking from Colombia and they talked about um, some of the uh, corruption and other things. And so we're very far from meeting that goal and we're not making much progress, et cetera. So uh, for the second one, we are reducing the proportion of unsentenced detainees, this is to reduce it, and we're not reducing it even in the developed countries, we're kind of going backwards. Increase the proportion of countries with independent uh, national human rights institutions. The developed, wor developed world does have these institutions that protect uh, or try to protect human rights on a national basis. So um, that's the progress. And this was a short, not so short, deep dive into the water goals. So they are part of this framework of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. They were adopted in 2015 when Ban Ki-moon was Secretary General of the United Nations. And they're our shared vision of humanity and a social contract between the world's leaders and the people. And they're a to-do list for people and planet and a blueprint for success. And I just need a couple more minutes because I want to just go into this. I want to leave this on a good note. Are they perfect? No. Are they the best plan going? They're the only one pretty much. And without a doubt, so we, many, many people around the world are working to meet these goals for all of humanity. And are we on track to meet them? Well, you just saw that we're all, we're making progress. Um, many goals are, we have a long way to go and the coronavirus has put us farther behind schedule, but there's still hope. Change has happened before and I wanna show you how it's gonna to continue to happen too. We're seeing it with the green recoveries being adopted in many countries. And we've seen many, many amazing changes in the past. This all started, our modern era began when we, uh, with this uh, invention of the steam engine. And from there, we harnessed fossil fuels and it is fossil fuels and that power that took, our world took off. We had the industrial revolution and we can now where we powered uh, many ma uh, machines at once and we started automated manufacturing. We now have, a tr we've had a transportation revolution. In 1900, people used horses, still used horses for uh, transportation and could only go 30 miles in a day. And now you can go halfway around the world in a day. So uh, we also have a, had a communications revolution and what used to take weeks and even months Heck, now we even get spam from halfway around the world. We have such a communication revolution. 
Last century, we did have a green revolution. When I was young, they said, how are we gonna feed all these people? And we did. And yet we are finding that this isn't sustainable. So we need to change our practices again. We are still undergoing healthcare revolution and people now are living that with cancer and surviving cancer. Vaccine for this pandemic, instead of taking a decade, just took one year. And of course, we're in the middle of an information revolution and all you have to do is Google it if you wanna find out about anything. And we're seeing, we have the technology to see the entire planet with a radar, Doppler radar and a seismographs to see um, our tectonic motion. We have satellites in the air, thousands of them in the sky that can measure, they can now measure the movement of the surface in terms of centimeters, as well as methane leaks in real time as well, and so many other things with those satellites. And we have buoys and other instrumentation in the ocean, but that's actually one of the areas we're lacking most. And so we have all these revolutions going on and now we have gone on and we're on the cusp and now what we need and where we're at is a sustainability revolution. And you guys, it will take lots of changes in our infrastructures, in our culture and in our habits. And so just a couple things you can start doing right now that'll help meet these sustainable development goals is to go on the United Nations websites and learn about them. Um, you can see their targets and index, index, indicators. You can see progress reports, and you can even learn about different courses and publications that are available. And we're gonna throw the links to all these in there. They have a lazy person's guide to saving the world. And I'm just gonna hit some of the highlights. Uh, and you can do things from your couch, like save electricity, turn the lights off, et cetera. Stop paper statements for your bills contact your local and national authorities, as well as private and uh, public corporations that you do business with and tell them that you want more sustainable policies. Things you can do home from home are cut down on waste. You can use refillable containers all like uh, I have. You can eat less meat. You don't have to go vegan, but just eat, by eating less meat will, will uh, help. Um, take short showers. You could air dry clothes in the summer when it gets hot. I put out a clothesline in my back and I don't use my dryer in my house. You can do things in your neighborhood like shopping local. Please continue to vote. And again, to vote for sustainable policies and representatives. And my pet peeve, don't let your car idle. It's one thing to be polluting when you have to get from one place to another, but to sit there and uh, letting your car idle, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your resource and you are spewing greenhouse gases and other pollutants into the atmosphere. If you're not comfortable in your car with it off then find another place to wait or don't get there early. That's my opinion and that's, it's my pet peeve. Things you can do at work are to promote energy efficiency or waste reduction and pretty much promote sustainable practices. Does your organization have an office of sustainability? For example, so the bottom line is that you've seen where we are with the water goals and you've seen a little bit of what we need to do to achieve all these SDGs. So when we begin to blend these policies and actions that promote healthy economies with social inclusion and we move towards sustainable environmental actions, then we're gonna be creating sustainable development and we'll be creating a world where all our children and their children will grow up healthy and production, productive. And I wanna thank you very much for having me. And if you're interested in learning more about the connection between society and nature, feel free to contact me through my website. I'd love to help you. And on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, answer any questions you might have. Wow, thank you so much, Susan. That was not only it's incredibly informative, but also visually compelling. The presentation you put together was so well done. Um, so thank you thank so you. much. Um, I know we're a little bit past the hour, but we have a people that are still here and we have a few questions in the chat as well. Um, so I'd love to allow any questions to be asked to Susan at this time. Um, Sorry about that. No worries at all. That was so informative and um, 
my brain is like a sponge right now. I just want to soak up all of the information um, because there's so much knowledge in there. There's so much to know. And I'm so grateful for you for sharing what's going on in the world right now about all of these areas that we focused on. Um, and then what progress is also being assessed. So just getting that idea is just really great. So thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Are there any questions? I see one. There's one in I the see chat. To what extent are local solutions helping to inform global solutions? Uh, for example, reduction in gun violence and Newark, New Jersey is a positive example. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that's the case in, in many areas. I don't know that I, I have, uh, I fully understand that. Is Rachel still here? Does she want to expand on that? Yeah, it was just something actually that came across in um, a news feed that I had come across and it was, it's just a statistic that is coming up because obviously of recent events and just um, Newark Police Department took a different route and the way that they're doing it is really resulting in absolutely no gun violence. It's a really great model to lift up. You know, in Asbury Park, there is an organization that's focusing on uh, redu reduction of in-school suspension, really helping youth to be successful at containing their emotions, not just youth, but staff. And, and so I'm always interested in these microcosm examples of how they can be so much bigger. Right, cool, thanks. And uh, you know, there are too many examples for me to even be aware of, but there's that new motto, which I love, which is think global and act local. And I do a lot of uh, work on teaching people about climate change. And while we do look at it as a global issue, we have to have local, the solutions have to be local. They have to be local everywhere. So uh, anytime we have something that we can celebrate, in my opinion, that's what we need to do. So I see Kay has a hand up. Yeah, because um, I'm thinking when, when we talk about waste, I'm thinking about um, composting. In my church several years ago, we started a community garden. And one of the things that's part of the garden is we compost. Now, um, what we do is we only compost from like April to November because then once the snow starts, the place we were composting, we don't remove snow there because you, you just couldn't. So, um, but I'm just curious if other communities, like I know New York City, they instituted a, um, some kind of a composting um, thing in New York City. And I'm wondering if, if you know to what extent other communities are doing that kind of thing, you know, um, offering it to the community, for example, you know. Uh, it's a growing, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know it's a growing in popularity. I spent uh, 18 years in Seattle and in the whole Seattle area, uh, before I moved back, I moved back to Jersey about 10 years ago, actually it was just about 10 years ago. And uh, in Seattle, they had not only weekly garbage and weekly recycling, but there was also weekly compost, actually compost everything. Thing, yeah. And we had mm -hmm. a big container and they would pick it up for free. And then the composting place you would sell it in big bags, like at Home Depot or something. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and I know New York City, like you said, is offering it, San Francisco. The benefit of composting is reducing material from the landfills. So this is going in partially as zero waste. There's actually, uh, yeah. one of the issues we have to remember is no matter what we're talking about, there is no perfect solution. Because actually uh -huh. the action of composting emits some greenhouse gases. So because as, things de as plant life deteriorates, it emits some methane. So among other uh -huh. things. So, it's not a perfect, perfect solution here also. And yet we want mm -hmm. to do it to keep the stuff out of those landfills. It's a good plan and to reuse, you're locally reusing the waste to create good soil for growing new things. And as the soil stays healthy, we're sequestering more carbon. So there's this cycle and, and yes, this is one of the benefits uh, of doing things like composting and we need more, uh, municipalities to offer that service mm -hmm. I think. yeah 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Know, you. You have to wonder where you're going to do it because if you've ever been near compost piles, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they can not smell. I compost in my yard and it does not smell because we use a lot of brown uh, leaves in it. Right. But on a really hot day, in the towns by me, they have compost piles and I don't really, I'm glad I don't live next door. So <laughs> there, again, we have to balance the needs of society as well. But composting is what, a great practice. Yeah, but would that also have something to do with the, um, uh, whatever the good practice around composting is? You know, uh, I mean, when the resources are put there to really tend to it, I, I wonder if that minimizes something like uh, smell, because I've seen that in our own composting. When we finally got somebody who really knew composting, because he works in one of the towns in New Jersey and he's the composting uh, person. So, um, you know, it made, it made a big difference because our compost doesn't have the smell that it would occasionally get. Yeah. Right. Well, well, again, you have, the the correct way they say is to even number of brown and green and what's brown yeah. and what's green. Like at our house, we actually save a lot of our dead leaves. We don't, we get rid of a lot of them, but we save a whole bunch. And as the year goes on, we put them in our compost pile. Uh -huh. That's our yeah. brown. So mm -hmm. yeah, but it's hard to, to do that, to make sure it doesn't smell. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's a great question. Are there others in the chat? I have, I'm trying to get through it here. Uh, thanks for that question. Really, it was good at Kay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Kay. Something about the lead pipe re replacement and is there a connection to the United Nations SDG? Well, safe, basic water to all. And uh, is, is having a lead pipe safe uh, water? No. You know, so it does address that. And I'm sure they would count it as an indicator towards that. Same in Flint, Michigan. So that was a good question too. Uh, anything else? I think that that's about all the I questions. I think that's it. Oh, let's see. Unless we have a new. Oh, okay. Now I think that's it. Unless anyone else has any questions for Susan that are, isn't in the chat. This was, again, just so informative. And I also just want to thank you for ending it as well with ways that we can contribute and things that individuals can do, because sometimes that's the hardest information to find. And the, just also just to know you know, you, you want to do something to help contribute, but it, it's hard to know where to start. So just providing these links again, thank you for that. And then also just, you know, we've been through a lot and, you know, we've, we have a long way to go, but it doesn't mean that we can't have a sustainable revolution happening. And I think that's, that's so true and so important. Thanks. And I, I just want to mention, you had talked about climate anxiety when we were prepping for this. Yes. And to me anyway, knowing that I'm doing something really helps me to alleviate some of that stress because at least I know one person out of 7.8 billion is doing something. And actually I know that everyone here, so now we're up to a few more and we're all doing something and each thing composting or walking or just combining rides even to combining chores to reduce our driving buying a, a higher uh, gas mileage car and better yet go start those evs are coming out and uh they're more and more models and they i just drove to boston this weekend to visit my grant my daughter up there uh, she needed some help and so we did 200 miles each way in one day compared to those 30 miles by horseback. So that's one of the amazing things. But on the mass turnpike, we saw a whole bunch of Tesla uh, charging stations going in at the service stations. So that to me was really exciting news. And uh, so I'm hoping that things like progress like that continues. And I don't have a Tesla yet, but I would like one. So uh, <laughs> maybe next time I speak to you, I will. 
I drive yeah. a hybrid just for the record. So. Nice. <laughs> well, it's a step in the right direction. You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you so much, Abby, for having me. I'm sorry I went over a little bit. Uh, no, that's totally fine. And I it wanted was, it to be comprehensive. It was, worth it. It was so. yes, it was a wealth of information. And I, yeah, I can't thank you enough for being our guest and sharing all that you know and all that you do with us tonight and with all the attendees. Again, thank you very much. It really is a pleasure. And thank you to all of Water Spirit for everything that you do. It's a wonderful organization. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll have this on our YouTube channel shortly, this recording. And um, we'll send a link to all the attendees as well with the, the links that you shared, all the resources. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Stay well.